I'm Jeff, I'm from B&H Photo in New York. B&H, for those who don't know, those who don't know is a camera, video, audio, computer, consumer electronics, primarily e-commerce company. And it's exciting for me to be here today. We're looking at working with Optimove. Wait, sorry, Peeny, we're working with Optimove. And I'm really excited to see what different people do with the tool, hear about all of these exciting practices. And I know after today, listening to Albina, to Stephanie, to Joe, I'm like, oy vey, what are we going to do? So the exciting part of this panel is here are four incredible practitioners of the CRM art and science. And they're going to share with us their wisdom today. So everyone sit down and let's have some fun. Okay. To start, what I'd like to do is each of the members of the panel introduce themselves, tell us a little bit about their company and what they do, and then we'll get into the fun. So who wants to go first? Asaf, why don't you go first? Uh, hi, everyone. I'm happy to see so many faces who survived until this hour. Um, so as I said, I'm Asaf Younger. I, I'm the director of user engagement for MyHeritage. I've been doing... Um, post-acquisition marketing, retention marketing, conversion marketing, everything marketing and operations for the last decade. Um, many years in the gaming, gambling industry for Playtech and then for uh, Gaming VC. And nowadays at MyHeritage, who I hope uh, all of you or most of you uh, know, um, we provide people with tools, awesome tools to research the family history, build the family trees, um, preserve it, share it, and uh, pretty much uh, discover and understand who they are. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it. So it's kind of multi-generational CRM. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. Goes okay. way back. But we're not, how about you? How, Cecilia, why don't you go next? Yes, I'm Cecilia Monte. I work for DSA, which is an online streaming service. Mm -hmm. Um, I've been working there for about one and a half years now, and I work as head of customer engagement. So I'm looking after the CRM team, and about a month ago, the customer support team as well. Congratulations. Thank you. Enrique? Sure. So my name is Enrique. I'm running the data science team at eBury. I'm not sure if you're familiar with eBury. It's a fintech company. We're a B2B company, actually, so uh, I don't think we have many here, but uh, we're basically providing financial services to SMEs that are looking at trading overseas, right? So picture any European SME that imports from China and sales in Europe. That's pretty much our target market. Great. And, uh, okay, let's, oh, I'm sorry. Lauren. <laughs> You're so funny. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Lauren Pika. Um, Could you just be, speak a little louder? I no, I'm just kidding. Um, I head up retention and engagement at Outbrain, uh, which is an Israeli native. Uh, so some of you might know us and work with us. We're a content marketing platform. Um, so anybody from a small blog writer to uh, you know a huge brand can work with us and get their uh, advertisements and content on big sites. Um, and I'm from New York, so Jeff and I are going to have a lot of fun today. Yeah, and we have three continents represented here today: uh, Israel, Spain. Spain slash UK, and New York. So let's continue. So this is what I was supposed to show a minute ago. That's us. Oh. Okay, that's interesting. You took the wrong F train, Jeff. I like press the same button, it goes back and forth. Okay, I guess we're, oh, that's all I have, even better. Do you like this slide or this slide? We'll do this one. Okay. So our first question is going to be, um, you know, a lot of times CRM is, is things like uh, weekly newsletters, birthday emails, and, and each of you came to organizations, you probably found that when you got there, and you've evolved it. So would love to kind of understand what was that moment, what were the first steps you took, and, and kind of what could you share with us from your experience? So who wants to go first? I'll jump in, why not? Um, Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I don't think you should wait for, to even know your customers' birthdays. I think CRM should start the day that you start your business. Um, I think uh, a big issue is it's thought about after the fact. A lot of people are really product focused, but you could have the best product in the world. It's nothing without your customer. So it, 
I really believe in customer centric, which I know has been a big uh, topic here this, these last two days. Um, but CRM, it's, it's not a technology, it's not a platform, it's, it's a way of thinking. Um, and the sooner we're able to kind of configure that mindset and always keep it back of mind uh, at the beginning of your business, I think the happier your customer and the happier your retention and, and yeah, and the better okay. your business. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, I can add, I, I definitely agree and I can add that as in any relationship, um, what matters is setting right the expectations. So um, in my eyes, it should happen right from the start. I mean, users come to a platform because they expect something. You, they want to, to do something on your platform or with your brand. For example, with MyHeritage, there's kind of a big premise that I'm going to discover things if I'm going to build my family tree on my heritage. Uh, but guess what? It's a hard work. And tons of people that we bring through Outbrain or other content or Facebook campaigns or whatever it is, uh, they end up on my heritage and they not necessarily know what it's about and what can I do here because it's not that simple as playing, a, I don't know, a slot game or something like that. So uh, setting up the expectation right from the start, right from the onboarding, uh, I think, or, or or actually in any other sweet spot that you can recognize through your journey of customers, um, this is where the meaningful stuff happens. This is where the real CRM work is all about. And yes, you can do monthly newsletters and birthday campaigns and whatever it is, but uh, as someone said here earlier, it's just because everyone are doing it. It's not the, the real goods that you want to do. Great. I think also it's really important to start looking at the onboarding from the beginning. Um, you get your acquisition, you get the customers in, and you want to make sure that they recognize the brand as soon as they get on the platform and that they get the experience that they expect from the acquisition that you've done. And I think that's something that also gets forgotten a lot in the beginning. So to make sure that you've got that onboarding leading into conversion and then hopefully getting the customers engaged and reducing your churn. Yes, completely agree with that point. Uh, that's something that for us has been key. Mainly uh, when I joined Ebree, this was a very relationship-based business model, right? So everything was dealt through the phone or directly face-to-face, -face, right? So we had to start by defining the channels, right? So that we could be, we would be able to serve these somehow execution-only clients, right? So that, that was three years ago. That's how we, how we all got started in, the, in all of this. And that's when we brought up the move-in, by the way. Okay. So that sounds great, it sounds easy, but, but what's the process like? You know, what's, what can you share? What does it look like? How do you begin? What were some of the challenges you faced? And um, you know, how did you make CRM more important in your organizations than it might have been before? I can, I can start on that one. And let me add one more thing. It was like there one point that, that everyone got it. Well, so I think actually for our business, one of the things we did, we used to have our CRM team sitting in France. We are a very global business. We existing in 183 markets. And having our CRM team sitting with only one market, which might be our main market, but still got too much focus from the other markets. So one of the decisions we did is that we moved our team to London, which is our global headquarters, and then made sure to make CRM one of our top priorities within the company. And this made sure that everyone from the top down realized that this is something we need to work on as a company together. So that together has made a lot of the changes. And then as well, bringing in third party providers like Optimu to make sure that we have the tools in place to set the CRM we want to have. Okay, great. I, I'll honestly admit, I think it's still a struggle, um, even for Outbrain, and we've been around for going on 11 years. Um, you know, it's the constant battle we deal with of retention versus acquisition. Um, so often, acquisition is a lot sexier. They're winning uh, over the customers, and then, yeah, we all retain them, but it's, it's a lot more difficult, right? There's a lot more that goes into it. Um, and I also find that usually it's blanketed. Uh, it's, oh, well, support's retention, and your retention, and he's retention, and we're all retention. But it's, again, it's more than that. So I think it's a, it's a daily battle that I know I deal with, um, you know, fighting for more overhead, um, you know, kind of trying to steal some of the, some of the acquisition assets for, for retention. 
So I'm sure uh, a lot of us deal with that, but it's a daily struggle that I have. And, and how, like, how has your organization evolved over time? So the structure, we heard a lot about that today, organization, organization structure. How did that show up in your... your yeah, so um, I actually started at Outbrain in November. Um, <laughs> I started at the beginning of a reorganization. Okay, so in your first year, how has your organization evolved? <laughs> yeah, um, well, I started under the customer success team, uh, which they then verticalized, uh, which they then customer-centricalized. That's not a word. Um, that's my own word today. Uh, so now I sit under mid-market. Uh, how we define that is we kind of have our brands and agencies, you know, the, the top of the top, they get a little bit more of the white glove service and we're taking more of a co-pilot approach um, of having a DIY and having uh, AMs or more like strategic partners. So that's where retention really sits um, as well as support. So it's certainly evolved from where it started. Uh, we're finding that it's working, um, definitely getting a lot more eyes, a little bit more attention, and hopefully in Q4, uh, some, more, some more heads. More heads. For us, as we were defining a new channel, we, we had to define a new function for it. So the, the, the customer success manager or account manager function, we didn't have that before, right? For us, it was creating the, an, an online dealer function that would not only somehow hold client's hand uh, during the activity in the platform, but more importantly, educate our clients, right? Because we're here talking about financial services, and traditionally you've had asymmetry in information, right, between uh, product knowledge and understanding of these solutions. And especially when you're talking about SMEs, there's a, a huge um, education piece to, his, to, to, to this component that, 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 yeah, you need to make them understand how these solutions can, can help them, right? So. And, and how, how is CRM scaled within your, within your company? I mean, and has it been a challenge to, to uh, convince people that we need to grow this? Yes, so the first piece for that is segmentation, micro-segmentation in our case with Optimove, right? Uh, we have the channels, we have the segments, then it's defining uh, the function that will be taking care of each of these segments, and then what are the, what are the actions, right? What are the, uh, in some cases it will only be providing the products and the channels for, for, for executing. In some of them, there will be more complex solutions, right? Um, so, such as those that you would find in corporate banking, for example, it's bringing them down to these SMEs. Great. All right, um, two things I can add. Um, first of all, you asked, when does it start within a company? I think that for most companies, it starts when you realize that you're actually spending a lot of those acquisition dollars and then like your retention or conversion of users is not up to your expectations, <coughs> not like um, what you'd want to, to get to. And then usually companies start to focus on the after acquisition uh, uh, part of the, of the journey or the life cycle. Um, if we talk about processes within the company and I can also share with what we've done in my heritage, um, it was a process, and I talked to many friends of mine who do things similar to what I do with MyHeritage, and they have like different products all over the world, or different s gaming studios all over the world, and it comes to a point where um, developers or product owners each work on, on their own thing, and then they like release it, and they communicate it, or send the email, and do things more sporadically. So I think that first and, forth, mo and foremost, you need to plant the idea that this is something that needs to be synced and centralized with one team, and that everything must go through this uh, central uh, uh, focal, point, fo focal point within the organization. Um, and once you do that on a broader perspective, then, like you said, you need to like, dive deep and try to understand your, your user base. And I think it's not just about the segmentation. I mean, okay, let's say I'm gonna segment to 20, 50, whatever uh, segments of my, can I really do something with it? Can I really go about meaningful treatments, meaningful campaigns that will get to where I wanna go? And it doesn't have to be like get them to deposit or get them to buy something if you're e-commerce or whatever. It's just get them to the next stage or get them more engaged in order to actually progress with your uh, product or whatever it is that you're offering. So constantly showing progress, and it sounds like it's one step at a time with some big moves yeah. to, uh, to London. <laughs> um, so, so again, uh, you know, the four of you are in organizations that are more advanced than 
probably the average. How do you how do you um, how do you know when it's working? How do you measure success? Um, and what is what does success look like? You know, how does each of your organizations define success from from what you're doing? You look like you're ready yeah, with the I mic. Yeah, I can start. I can start. All right. Uh, okay. Actually, I, I like. We, we can speak about uh, card recovery emails and uh, various campaigns and uh, um, all sorts of things. But actually, we talked about onboarding uh, just before, and I can tell you something which is quite, let's say, uh, untraditional or um, exceptional to what people usually do. So most of the registration processes nowadays are very short, right? People want you to get registered. Let me get your email, and I'll do something with it after, right? But let's just... Uh, have this bait and, uh, and, and, and hook you in our, our product. And with MyHeritage, we, we understood that, yeah, we have tons of users who saw a TV commercial uh, in the US or Europe or, or clicked an ad on Facebook and they get there and uh, they, not, they don't know what they need to do now uh, when, when they got on MyHeritage. So what we did, we, uh, and it's kind of an engagement which is a bit different. It's more on the product side. So we kind of extended our registration process. Uh, we call it Magic 7. We ask you to uh, tell us a bit about your core family. So put in some details about your parents, your grandparents, your grand -gra grandparents. And then um, what we do, we start calculating this information and our algorithm starts to work. And uh, instantly, we try to get you some discoveries. And why is that? Because this is why you came here. You came to find something, hopefully, that you didn't know about your family, about your history, and that's the way of doing it. So maybe each and every one of you can reflect on what is it that you know, people want to do on your platform? What can you do right from the start? And so, first of all, if I'm able to, give them, to bring them discoveries, that's measurable. I can, I can measure that. And obviously, we saw double digits increase in uh, percentages. Uh, uh, on that thing. But what it also does, and, uh, and this is great, it helps you to start segmenting your user base because now you know, okay, these are the guys who did it. These are the guys who didn't. These are the guys who started and abandoned in the, uh, in the middle and so on and so forth. So right from the start, right from the onboarding, you can start segmenting and you can do um, meaningful stuff with this thing uh, onwards in order to again, get to where you want to go. Makes sense. Maybe this is the tech in me, um, but kind of like GoDaddy was talking about earlier this morning, I think there's kind of the culture aspect of, of success, and then there's the business need um, success, excuse me. Um, on the cultural side, uh, this is kind of overused, I would say, in the tech industry, but I'm all about many wins on our team. Um, we're hosting an event in a couple weeks for leads and clients and a mini win for me was a client so pumped about this event. He was so ready to talk content and drink cocktails. Um, but then this morning I signed on to Optimove and I saw a campaign I went live with three days ago. Um, already generated, you know, 40K in uptick for active users. So for me, that's a mini win, right? So culturally we share these successes every day with each other and kind of keep each other going. Um, but on the business needs end, you know, we're using all of our platforms to check LTV, check retention, check churn, check risk of churn, you know, all these things that we've kind of been, all these metrics that we've been discussing today. So I think finding the balance of, of the metrics, make sure your, your data is successful, but also that your customers are happy. Because, you know, we get, we get upset customers all the time who open our emails, and then they reach out to support really angry, they still open our emails. So uh, kind of finding the balance of reality versus digital, I think is really important. Great. Yeah, we, I, I agree with that. And I think also working in the music industry and something that is as highly personal as music is to most people, it's, it's kind of our success is around the engagement we're getting and making sure that we are reaching the customers with the right uh, content. When I first started, um, I was told that we were sending out a push notification about a new Justin Bieber album to our entire database. 
For me, that is the worst kind of customer engagement you can do. A lot of people will be very angry about receiving a Justin Bieber push notification. Are you not a believer? <laughs> I am not a believer. So, so that's kind of part of what we're looking at, is making sure that that kind of engagement, we have a subscription-based model, so we only have like a one-month pay, and then we can't upsell or anything like that. So it's just looking at how often our customers stream, how much they engage with our product, how many of our different products they take part of. Were there any surprises from the Justin Bieber uh, <laughs> push notification? Um, the 80-year-old segment or something? <laughs> not, not really. Unfortunately, as you can imagine, there was a lot of unsubscription, oh. which is the worst you can get as a CRM practitioner. Delete the app. <laughs> Delete the app. Enrique? And yes, success for us uh, is translated. Well, of course, so leaving KPIs aside, revenue retention, year-on-year -year growth, so on. Uh, for us, it's clients that come to Ivory uh, looking to execute payments online. That's basically what they're after. And they gradually evolve towards more complex solutions, right? And they understand what we can do for them, right? And, and, and in one single place, they can be uh, somehow mitigating other risks and, and, and accessing some of the solutions that traditionally were not available for them in, in traditional corporate banking. Is there, is there like any one big success we heard about the Justin Bieber story, but one like huge success that, that you can think of that's a good example of some of the fruits of your efforts? My onboarding campaign is killing it right now. Um, so I'm really excited about that. Um, yeah, so our open rates are like in the 50s. Um, our click-through rates are 10 to 12%. I mean, I usually take 30% and 3% as kind of a win for active users. So. I know I'm super pumped about onboarding right now because to me that's the one series every single customer is going to get before they hopefully not unsubscribe or tune us out in, at any capacity. So this is the one that they're super like really paying attention to to learn how to use our product. Yeah, we had um, um, opposite to the Justin Bieber, uh, we did a Metallica launch of their entire back catalog. And that was super targeted. It was going out to hard metal fans. And a lot of metal fans are actually very loyal. It was also looking at customer listening to similar music, trying to kind of widen what they listen to. We went through all the different channels. So it was email push, in-app, social media retargeting. And we saw a really good uptake on that campaign. So that's something that worked really well for us. The more segmented, the better. Great. Anything for you guys that stands out? Or? No? Yeah, I mean, there are many examples. Um, I think you, you talked about a subscription based, and I think one of the things we started doing in the past couple of years, and uh, we, we, we're seeing huge uh, increase uh, uh, from these activities, is actually A B testing, renovating our old emails um, that are supposed to hopefully convert people and, and get them either uh, renew their subscription or do their subscription, upgrade their subscription for the first time. And one of the things that we do, not only that we segment it and uh, uh, you know, we personalize, we also check the context of what, what was the last thing you tried to do for which you, you made a paywall or you got to uh, a checkout page but even eventually uh, decided to abandon it. And once you get that uh, personalized, for example, uh, hey Lauren, uh, I saw you were browsing through uh, Aunt uh, Lori's uh, census record from uh, 1941 in uh, uh, whatever uh, uh, in uh, New York. Then that does the trick, it touches it, it's very personal. And then uh, we're seeing great success from these actually automated emails that we put in place, and uh, uh, it, does, it does good, good work. How did you know I had an Aunt Lori? Yeah. We'll hear about that during the Q&A. Um, um, when, when you look at, at CRM and your organizations, it's clearly a competitive advantage you have. At, at what point did it, did it get there? Did it become a competitive advantage? And, and why are you guys better at pleasing your customers than your competitors? Yeah, so, go ahead. Okay, no, so for us, it's um, a lot about content. As I was saying, we've got a kind of a very highly individual, our users like the music they like, etc. So we've got a very good algorithm uh, based on something called flow or it outputs flow, which is basically 
music recommendations based on the music you already like. And this is something that works really well for our users. We use a lot of our CRM pushes around that. You will get music recommendations, you will get album releases based on previous listening history. We also have a lot of content that we kind of create in-house, original content, a bit around the kind of Netflix model. So we're doing our in-house podcasts, et cetera, that is an, a, kind of an advantage to us from a competitor point of view. And we also kind of support new artists that we think are going to become big within the coming next years. And they've got a big loyalty to our brand. It's called These Are Next. So all of those creates a big content base for us to use. And being a subscription model, engagement and making people keep paying every month is what we need to do. So for us, the con content is key to making sure that the users stay with us. Great. So for us, and, and following up on a point that was um, pointed out this morning, it's not about the, the amount of touch points that we have. So it's not about the, the daily, weekly, monthly communications that we have with clients, right? And the other day, our clients are financial directors or CFOs from SMEs. They don't really want to know about every single macroeconomic event that is happening out there, every single Federal Reserve meeting or Bank of England meeting, but they just want to be uh, called or contacted at the right point in time, right? So whenever they, so there is something that truly impacts their business, right? And that for us is what our, our key and strategy is. And is that very specialized based on different, what you've learned about the various customers? Exactly, so that comes all the way, so prior to onboarding even, so at a prospecting stage, that is already being uh, gathered, captured throughout onboarding and then throughout the customer uh, uh, life cycle, that is constantly being uh, validated, yeah. Yeah, I think our greatest competitive uh, advantage is the fact that, um, so to speak, we cut the bullshit. Meaning, my heritage. They promised they were going to curse a lot. There, yeah. Here we go. So, so I mean, there you go. There you go. Curse. I don't speech, and uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, uh, but basically, my heritage is all about people and their families, and we respect that, and we. Appreciate it. And I'm not sure if it's. Do you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Um, so. When we write our emails to our users, we do it in a very different ways. I mean, a lot of my friends who actually see the emails I'm sending, they're saying, what? You're sending so much text and so much copy in your email? Who reads that? But imagine that. I mean, if your sister or father or mother or someone from your family is going to email you a personal email, they're not gonna put a banner and you know a GIF flashing in it or whatever and take this off for CTA buttons, CTA buttons. It's gonna look totally a different thing, and this is what we try to do. Yeah, we have all the tricks, and we you know aspire to do one-on-one -on -one, um, scalable marketing, segmented as as much as possible, and everything is prioritized and so on and so forth. But the the, the real thing is that. We're truly there. We, uh, we, we're truly honest. We're truly transparent. Uh, we talk about things as they are. Uh, because in the end of the day, um, our business is constantly changing. You know, uh, family trees, it's like a, a beast that grows and, and, uh, and shrinks because people add stuff, people take out stuff. Our algorithms work constantly all the time. So. We want to be in a place where we, we're completely honest with the users, and this is what we do in our email campaigns and in our you know, transactional or one-on-one -on -one events-based uh, 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 emails that are triggered. And it works. People actually read it. And I think it started in a place that we didn't have the technology to actually you know, do fantastic HTMLs. So we just sat down and we, we wrote things that we believed in. But with time, we kind of educated our, our user base, and this is what we're now accustomed to get from my heritage. This is like the relationship we have, this is the expectation, and uh, yeah, it's a, it's a great advantage because you know you're gonna get something which is um, just real. Right, and I, you know, thinking back to Blake this morning about the storytelling and these emotional moments, I can only imagine when you send these emails out, oh, I never knew that, and, and the connection it builds with, with my heritage. Yeah, think about, you took a DNA test with my heritage, I'm gonna send you the results, and you know, it just happened that uh, we discovered that uh, you know, we found your siblings or something. These things matters. 
uh, we, we have photos discoveries. We can come up with photos of someone from your family generations ago. Um, other stuff we mapped, like, I don't know, most of the Jewish cemeteries around the world. So if you put someone who died in your family and you're Jewish, most likely we know where they're buried and we'll bring that image of the, the, the tombstone to your family tree. So all these things are very personal and they matter to people. So uh, we try not to mess around with it. We try to be very real with what we communicate. Great. Um, next question is about keeping ahead of the curve. So, you know, what are your plans to, to keep this advantage going? To What's the future look like? How are you going to stay ahead of everyone else trying to copy you and, and you know, imitate these great things you've already got out there? Let's see. Lauren, how about you? Hello. Um, honestly, I would say imitation is, is flattery, right? Um, kind of back mixing this in with the competitor advantage question. Uh, I don't think it's about our competitors. I don't think it's necessarily staying above the game. I think it's focusing on your customers. Your customers are your customers. You're the ones that know them best. So the more human you treat them, uh, the more that you'll get out of it. I'm also in B2B. I know a lot of us are B2C here. Um, but when it comes to staying ahead of the game, it really is, that's where it becomes product focused. Uh, in our business, we all have our own publishers. So it, it makes sense that people work with both us and our competitors. It, it's just um, more content and more places. So really, we just have to give them the better experience. So I think, uh, of course, I'm ramping up with Optimove. I'm in the middle of a 30-day IP warm-up. So that'll allow me to send out a lot easier, more dynamic mailings, not just, hey, Lauren, but uh, kind of like what you were talking about, your performance user by user, not blanketed statements. Um, but I also don't think that we can let all these platforms get away from us, right? Uh, these platforms kind of pop up every day. They're agile. They're changing every day. So I think what's going to be an advantage for us as we look forward is to make sure that we're keeping the human. You know, we should really talk to our customers, not at our customers. Um, you're more of a partner. You're not, um, you're not a money maker, although in the back of uh, obviously our heads, it's about revenue. Right. And it's a common theme from all of you, that, that authentic, tight, real connection with your customers. And the more, the more we do that, the more successful we are. Yeah, for us it's also um, to tie in with that, to be where the customers are. We have a lot of interesting things coming up with Google Home, Alexa, wearables, which for us is very interesting. I mean, the music works very well with the kind of audio control devices. So this is something from a CRM point of view that I need to work out together with our partners and with our team how we talk to our users through those devices. At the moment, there isn't that much communication. It's go through emails or push. It's on your computer or on your phone. So how do we communicate to the users that are only using us through a voice control device? So this is something that is very important to us to keeping ahead of the curve and making sure we are where the users are. Great, thanks. Yes, completely in line. So for us, it's about uh, listening to clients, understanding what their needs are, not talking about products, but talking about solutions, and feeding that back to product teams so that we can build the solutions and with that, uh, maintain the relationships or even uh, improve our relationship with them. Okay. Yeah, so for us, um, it was quite a while ago when we decided to put the, I mean, it's a buzzword, right? But we, we really decided to put our customers in the center. And what it means is that not only, um, you know, we, um, everything we do within the product and the marketing is very customer facing, but we also do things that are, in many cases, are left behind. For example, we constantly improve and, uh, uh, and, and extend and renovate our help centers and our Q&A's databases and we'll try to be available for people as much as possible. Yes, you can call the customer support, and I didn't say, but MyHeritage, uh, uh, we operate in 42 different languages, so all our marketing, email campaigns, everything we do is like tons of languages, and we got phone support in all these languages, etc. cetera. Uh, uh, but we also have uh, over 90 million trees creators globally, so uh, the, the load is massive, and if you really want to put the customer in the center, you have to do things 
uh, that will allow them to get to you and get help from you uh, as much as possible. So we do all that um, with the customer support teams and the, uh, um, you know, the help centers, et cetera, et cetera. But we also, from uh, let's say the things that are more uh, close to us from email marketing perspective and, and automated emails and so on and so forth, we constantly review, we constantly A-B test, uh, we constantly revisit emails that we've done and we, we actually most of the times ask ourselves what was good about it, what we did well, and how can we improve it? Because if I understand what I did well, I can redo it and uh, uh, um, hopefully be better. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's a constant process of uh, revisiting things that you do, um, but hopefully it will keep us where we are. Okay. That's great. Um, we're going to ask, see if anyone has questions in a minute, but I'm just curious for the panel, any, anything today that stood out to you, what you heard, or any moment that said, wow, I didn't think about that? Just un unscripted question. Well, I love corny copy. Um, so eggs? Eggs? Eggs. Uh, you have to read my copy. My last newsletter, I was quoting Earth, Wind, and Fire. And I'm sure there's not a lot of people that understand that, but I did, and it was at the bottom of my email, so maybe people don't always scroll all the way to the bottom, so I got a little, little chuckle out of it, and it performed really well. Um, so I'll Let have me to guess say, we're going to see eggs next week. Um, I don't know if eggs and outbrain go together, but uh, definitely had me stern on, by the dozens. <laughs> anything, Enrique, anything? today that jumped out at you and surprised you? Yes, this, the, well, this morning's uh, keynote, I, I was amazed with this transformation, transformation. I've been a, a GoDaddy client for, for a while, and it is true that how that, that shift in, in, in its branding, right, uh, how that's moved. So that was, I mean, hearing it from the inside, it, it was pretty insightful. I agree, agree with Enrique. I think that uh, was a very interesting um, speech and it's a lot of what kind of I can take with me back to my team and my company and the way to kind of make the changes that we want to happen for CRM and for the business in general. Yeah, I think one of the main takeouts uh, that probably all of us can agree about is that, you know, we're all facing the same challenges uh, from different um, industries, different perspectives, um, and uh, yeah, I think it's a great opportunity to share and have days like this. Thanks to the panel and thank you all and go from there.